Good morning, my name is Rob, and if you're new to the channel, I'm currently converting my 2007 Ford E250 van into a camper van. It is Memorial Day weekend, so I have a three-day weekend to work on the van. I was kind of, sort of, hoping to have the van finished by this weekend, but it's very, very far from being finished. I am having some coffee this morning and I'm sitting across from one of my favorite little breakfast hidey holes, which is a little gravel entrance road to a oil rig that happens to be right across the street from the runway of a small airport. So sometimes I'll grab a morning coffee and I'll park here straight ahead as the end of the runway and sometimes planes will take off and fly right overhead. It's kind of fun. Anyway, uh, my goal for this weekend is to finish the slat bed. By finish, I mean start and finish a pull-out slat bed. I don't have any plans on how to build this bed. I've watched probably a dozen YouTube videos of other people that have built a slat bed, a pull-out slat bed that's uh, a bench when it's uh, pushed in and a bed that converts out. I've ordered <coughs> two six inch thick firm foam they're not really mattresses it's upholstery uh, foam but I think it's gonna work for a bed and if not then I guess I'll use it for something else but that's the plan it's a three-day weekend let's go as the kids say <laughs> as my kids say Before I start working on the bed, I want to build a box that covers the wheel wells in the rear of the van. If you've ever looked inside the rear of a van and taken a tape measure or a square, you know that there are absolutely no 90 degree angles in a van whatsoever. I was kind of having a hard time measuring and visualizing what I wanted to do and how I wanted to cover up the wheel well. So I came up with this idea of building a square box just to cover the wheel wells. So I've seen people cover the wheel wells with sound deadening material and insulation. And I think that's a good idea. That's probably a better idea than what I'm doing in my van. But what I decided to do was build a rectangular box to fit over the wheel well, and then line the inside of that box with sound deadening material and insulation. I think that's gonna be a lot easier for me to build than trying to build a box with all kinds of crazy angles. Now I was having a difficult time figuring out exactly what I wanted to build and so I decided to build a mock-up out of cardboard and fortunately my family orders items from Amazon three to five times a week so cardboard in this house is not a difficult thing to find. I grabbed a couple of boxes, I took some rough dimensions and decided to cut out sheets of cardboard and build a cardboard version of the box before I actually made one out of wood. The general measurements I used, which turned out not to be perfect, was 34 inches long and then 10 inches deep and 10 inches wide. This did not account for the slight slope towards the bottom of the wheel well. It's not exactly flush the way it sits on the floor. And so uh, I'm glad that I did this because I figured that out before I actually decided to build the wooden version of this box. Once I had all the pieces cut out, I taped everything together with some white duct tape. By the way, duct tape comes in a lot of different colors and I prefer white because I often use it as labels. I put the white duct tape on boxes or bins and write on it with a Sharpie. Also, my family is the five time returning champion of our local 4th of July kids parade. And all of our floats were built with colored duct tape, cardboard, spray paint, and a red wagon. Now that I think about it, this isn't all that different from building one of those 4th of July floats. Once I was finished taping the box together, I walked it out to the van, put it in place 
which kind of gave me an idea what the final box would look like and also to see if this size covered the wheel well. And what I found out was it fit, but it was pretty tight. This cardboard mock-up again was 10 inches deep, 10 inches tall, and 34 inches long. For the wooden box that I decided to build, I expanded those dimensions slightly and made it 11 inches by 11 inches by 36. Now, I know that building this box to go over my wheel wells is going to take a lot of long, straight cuts, and I don't own a table saw because, frankly, I'm a little afraid of them. So, instead, what I decided to do was build a track guide for my circular saw. I've seen other people build these on YouTube, and to be honest with you, it doesn't look like rocket science. All the ones I've seen use quarter inch plywood. You lay two layers, one on the bottom, one on the top, and you set a width that is the exact width of your circular saw so that you can use it as a guide. Essentially, you rest your saw on the lower piece and the blade hangs just over the edge of the lower piece of wood and you're bumping the guide of the saw up against the upper piece. Now in the back of my workshop, I had some spare quarter inch plywood. It's actually not ideal. It's really, it has brick finish on the back side, and I used it when I was building a bar in our living room, but it'll work. Once I cut the two strips, all I did was put down a layer of wood glue, put the top strip on the bottom strip, and use some of these clamps to clamp everything together until the wood dried. I talked about these quick release pistol grip clamps in a previous video. My honest opinion is you can't own enough of them, especially if you're working on projects by yourself. They are a perfect second set of hands for every woodworking project. You can use them to hold pieces of wood together. You can hold wood on your workbench. You can hold things together while glue's drying. You can hold things in place while you're driving screws. I mean, really, uh, they just hold things together. <laughs> That's what clamps do. And again, once the pieces were cut, I applied this wood glue to the back of one piece of wood, flipped it over, put it in place, and then used these clamps to hold the two pieces together until the glue dried. I don't know what the lifespan of a bottle of wood glue is, but I've probably owned this bottle for 10 years. Maybe 15. Once the glue had fully dried, it was time to use my guide for my first long cut. Using the guide is as simple as clamping the guide to the piece of wood you want to cut, lining the edge of the guide up to the line where you want to cut, and running your saw right down the edge. Now my workshop is almost exclusively stocked with Ryobi tools. I like the fact that they are convenient and I like the fact that they are wireless so I'm not having to drag around extension cords. But the one thing I will say is I am not a fan of this circular saw. As you can see on this clip, I had a lot of trouble cutting through a simple half inch piece of plywood. Now what I didn't realize at the time was that my battery was running low. I thought the saw was just having trouble cutting through the wood, but even when it's fully charged, this thing has nowhere near the power of a corded circular saw. Now I just had to measure out the rest of the pieces and use my handy little track guide to cut the rest of them out. I do have to say it makes cutting straight pieces of wood a lot quicker. The last part of building a box is trying to get three independent pieces of wood to hold still while you drill holes into the end and eventually drive screws into it. It's a bit like wrangling cats. This is the first of many times that I was glad I had a drill to drill holes and an impact driver to drive screws. Not only does this save you a lot of time from switching bits back and forth, but when you're doing things with one hand, it's a lot more convenient to swap tools than it is to try to keep everything balanced while you're switching out drill bits. The box was a perfect fit. It fits right over the wheel well. And speaking of boxes, while I was doing this, something arrived from Amazon. This is, if everything works out, the new mattress for my van. This is a 
two foot wide by six foot long by six inch deep firm foam mattress designed for upholstery. Will this work for a mattress to sleep on in a van? Literally, I have no idea. There's $50 on Amazon, so I'm going to try it out. Also, for another $20, I got this, which is a slip cover made for mattresses up to six foot long, two foot wide, and six inches thick. First step is to open this, let it self inflate. Then I'm going to put this on it and maybe tonight I'm going to sleep on that mattress. First of all, don't get too excited. I did not sleep on the mattress that night. It took me two more days to build a bed. Second of all, a lot of people ask me why I do voiceovers on my videos. Well, you're about to find out why. I left my mic running during a lot of this part of the video, and you will find out that the entire time I'm working, I end up singing and making up stupid songs to myself. A couple of years ago, we ordered a bed mattress that had to be unboxed and it took 24 hours to inflate. I thought that's what this foam was going to do, but no. Whenever you remove the wrapping from the foam, it immediately unfolds, which, as you'll find out, was a bit of a surprise to me. I am the mattress king. Don't have to return it in this box because I sliced it in pieces and I'm going to put it up here out of the way hey 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 now I don't know what to do seems to have a cheesecloth over it I've ordered a giant white burrito <laughs> uh oh <laughs> surprise it's a mattress <laughs> surprise yeah, so that's why we do the voiceovers. Also, I understand YouTube's policy, but it's a shame you can't play copyrighted music because I'm a fan of some pretty awesome music, and I listen to music all the time when I'm working on projects. I cut this next clip down for both your sake and mine, but it took me 15 minutes to get this padded slip cover on the mattress, and what I realized is that it goes on like a shower curtain. It only covers the sides and the top. It doesn't cover the bottom, which won't work for me. That didn't stop me from climbing inside an 80 degree van and trying to take a nap though. Now that we got a mattress, we're gonna need one of those fancy slap beds to put it on. I wish I had better blueprints to share with you, but I literally drew these on a whiteboard in about 90 seconds. The mattress is six foot long, two foot wide, and six inches thick. So because it's two foot deep, that's 24 inches. And I'm going to put a second mattress behind it to be a backrest. So that's six inches thick. So six inches plus 24 inches is 30 inches. So the bed needs to be 30 inches deep. However, there's going to be a two inch overlap of the wood that slides out. So the main part of the base only needs to be 28 inches deep. I'm gonna put every other slat right down the middle. That's how you build a slat bed, I guess. I don't know, I'm figuring this out as I go. And I'm gonna make it 11 inches tall because that's how tall I made the box to go over the wheel well. A lot of these decisions seem like things I should spend a lot of time on, but literally you're watching me draw this in real time. The only other thing I had to figure out was how long to make the slats. Now originally I was going to make the longer slats 30 inches to cover the entire base and the shorter ones 24 inches, but I didn't have enough wood to do that so instead what I did was make the long ones 26 inches long and the shorter ones 23 inches long. I moved around one of my support beams, that makes everything add up to exactly 48 inches when the bed is expanded. Now I know YouTube offers video in HD, but it's a good thing it doesn't have smell-o-vision, or you could probably smell my brain burning at this point. Again, I'm literally figuring this out on the fly. I think these numbers will work, and if not, eh, it's only wood. Now one of the goals of this project is to keep the weight down, and so instead of using 2x4s, I decided to use 2x2s, which of course are not 2 inches by 2 inches, but 1.5 inches by 1.5 inches. You may recall that I bought these a couple of videos ago on a trip to Home Depot.
So in this clip, I've got two two by twos clamped together so I can cut them and they'll be the exact same length. But I want you to look at that back one real close. See how it doesn't line up flush? That's because this piece of wood is twisted. It's not really bent on the X axis or the Y axis. It's actually twisted. Now I watched a video recently where Van Itty Bitty said that she picked up some curbside delivery wood from Home Depot and that the quality wasn't very good. I think she understated how bad the wood from Home Depot is. All the pieces of wood that I got were literally garbage. My old friend Lefty taught me when you're not using a saw, unplug it. Don't be like Lefty. I decided the best way to attach all these 2x2s into a frame shape was to use pocket holes. Now if you've watched any van life videos, you probably know that pocket holes are the one and only way to attach two pieces of wood ever, ever, ever. Nails? No. Screws? No. Wood glue? No way. Pocket holes are the only way to do anything. <laughs> Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't really believe that. I've built lots of stuff in my life, and I've never actually used a pocket hole. But I guess I bought into the hype a little bit, and I wanted to try these out. So I bought an inexpensive pocket hole jig off of Amazon along with some pocket hole screws, a little pocket hole kit. I just really like saying pocket hole over and over, and I'm going to say pocket hole as many times as I can in this pocket hole video. In one of my favorite scenes from the original Matrix, Neo asks Trinity if she knows how to fly a helicopter. She says not yet. She downloads the manual and immediately knows how to fly a helicopter. YouTube's kind of like that. In the last clip, I didn't know how to drill a pocket hole, but I did pause the video. I went and watched four YouTube videos, came back, and now look at me. I'm the pocket hole king. If you're not familiar with pocket holes, the idea here is that this jig allows you to drill screws at an angle through one piece of wood and into another. This creates a much stronger joint than just attaching two pieces of wood end to end and drilling through one side. I did eventually figure out that you don't have to clamp the two pieces of wood together. All you need to do is drill the pocket hole into the one piece of wood and the screw takes care of the rest. I have to admit that the joints held together with the pocket hole screws are pretty sturdy, and this is starting to look like the top of a slab bed. One of the most frustrating things about these projects is that it took me half an hour to build this, and I cut this clip down to 10 seconds, so you're welcome. This is my test of the first slat. As you can see, it extends one and a half inches past the end of the frame. The piece that slides out is one and a half inches thick and will go underneath this piece of wood. Also, I forgot how strong the impact driver is and drove the screw right through this piece of wood, splitting it in half, so I did eventually replace this slat. Here's another shot of that twisted 2x2. Two two. I should have replaced it at this point, but I didn't replace it until the end of the project. Again, Home Depot, it's a little hard to build square things with pieces of wood that aren't square. With the top of the frame assembled, it was time to start cutting slats. Guess how many slats I need? I don't know, did you not see that drawing on a whiteboard? I have no idea what I'm doing. I just started cutting slats. So here's the genius system I came up with. Turn one slat sideways, put one flat, turn another one sideways, and then put a fourth one and screw that one in. So the every other one would be the ones that slide, and every other one needs to be screwed into place into the fixed position. Based on a bit of analytic geometry, I figured that the three quarters of an inch spacing between the slats, and, who are we kidding? I just used the slats for the space. I don't know how far apart to put them. Rinse and repeat. With all the stationary slats screwed into place, now it's time to start attaching the sliding slats. Again, I've attached the 2x2 uh, two two to the front of the frame, and the slats will attach to that, and another piece that will keep everything from sliding that I haven't added in yet. Once you get a system down, things start going pretty quickly. Again, I was using one slat sideways as a spacer so that all the slats would be parallel and equally distanced from each other. 
I can't repeat it enough how nice it is to be able to have both a drill and an impact driver so that you're not constantly switching bits between a drill bit and a driver bit. Remember that twisted board in the back? Well, now it's a problem because the slats won't go over it and I can't attach a leg to it. So now this board has to come off and be replaced. Should have done it in the beginning. The last piece of the puzzle is another two x two that runs all the way across and only attaches to the sliding slats. This will keep the slats from wiggling left and right and keep everything lined up straight. If I didn't know any better, I'd say this is starting to look like a slide out slat bed. I've seen other people have problems with the board sticking and not bouncing over the top like they're supposed to, so I use this Ryobi router and a rounding bit to round the edges of all the slats. By the way, I cut out the part where I opened this out of the box. I've never actually used a router before, but again, I saw one on YouTube. It looked pretty simple. It was pretty simple. After routing all the slats, I used a sander to make sure everything was smooth. This is another example of something that took me 20 to 30 minutes, but you're getting 10 seconds of it. Next, I painted the entire thing white. I'm cutting most of that footage out because this video is too long already, and also when I say I painted something white, you can probably imagine what that looks like. Also, painting is the absolute worst project for somebody with ADHD. All I want to do is stick my fingers in it over and over and over to see if it's dry yet. Surprise, it's not. Now, unfortunately, I ran into the same problem that some other people have, which is the boards began to bind because I had attached the guiding rail too tightly. So what I did to fix this was unscrewed every single screw, put a washer in between the slat and the sliding piece, which gives it just enough space to slide a little bit more freely, and then reattach the slats down into the same hole that I had already drilled. With washers placed underneath all the slats, the last thing to do was to cut and attach some legs onto the bed. I decided to make the bed 11 inches off the ground. Again, no real science here. I just came up with that number. If you'll recall at the beginning of the video, that's the same height as the box that goes over the wheel well. So the idea is that the back part of the bed will actually sit on top of that box, which will offer it a little bit of support. I used two by fours for the legs because I thought that would make the bed a little more sturdy. I also attached the rear legs together in an L shape using pocket holes. Look at me, pocket hole master, brought to you by pocket holes. I've read that some dinosaurs have a brain the size of a walnut. Mine must not be much bigger because if it were, I would have painted all these things at the same time. Also, I ended up using pocket holes on both sides of the leg. That way it has support forward and backward as well as side to side. I kind of wiggle when I sleep sometimes. After that, I attached legs number two three, and four. Before carrying everything out to the van, I decided to give it one last try. I said a little prayer to the van life gods, and sure enough, everything still works. Time to give it one last test. Time to take it out to the van and make sure it fits.
So this is the final test, and I'll tell you right now, it's not perfect. The biggest problem that I discovered is that the two by twos that run long ways, the six foot long ones, have a little bit of give in them. I probably should have used two by fours, but instead what I think I'll do is add a support leg in the middle. This van has a lot more work that needs to be done. I need to add insulation. I need to finish the walls. I need to put the floor back in. I've got a lot of things, but I'm gonna tell you right now, my next video, I will be sleeping in this van. Thanks for making it to the end of this one. Be sure to check out BigRobsVan.com for longer blog posts and also Big Rob's Van on Instagram for daily pictures. If you want to support my project and also see some behind the scenes clips and get some more information about the build, check out Patreon.com forward slash Rob O'Hare. And now, if you don't mind, I think I'm going to take a little nap.